Demonic possession is a pretty common trope in both the East and West, and for good reason. It fits right snugly into that primal fear of someone we trusted turning into something hated or evil. The most horrific examples come from movies like Annabelle or The Exorcist, in which the possession victim is something innocent, a doll and a little girl respectively. Your mother sucks cocks in hell. There's a reason for this, of course, for an otherwise innocent person or object to be transformed into something hideous and terrifying. To scare us, obviously, but also because it puts a much larger juxtaposition between the way things are right now and the way things should be. It plays on our ingrained perceptions and twists them. Little girls, for instance, are not usually vulgar. Stick your cock up her ass, you motherfucking worthless cocksucker. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help, but I just had to do it again. Chapter 2 of Higarashi, titled Watanagashi Hen, or Cotton Drifting Chapter, uses this concept of a relative innocent and takes it a step further. In most depictions of demonic possession in Western media, at least, the main heroes are exorcists or ghost hunters or other types of people in relative positions of power who have the ability to fix the situation. But Higarashi takes this concept and adds an important question. What if you were powerless to help? What if you were an idiot teenage boy who can't really comprehend what's happening until it's too late? Continuing on from the first chapter, Watanagashi Hen plays around heavily with the concept of powerlessness, and as you'll see, it's handled almost entirely differently than an Onikakushi Hen. I'm very excited to delve into it with you, so without further ado, I'm Hedgehog, welcome back to this nonsense, and this is Higurashi. For those of you who are new around here, first of all, do you not know how to read? This is clearly labeled second chapter. Go watch the first one, numbnuts. Second, what you are about to see is a breakdown and analysis of the second chapter of Higarashi. It is entirely friendly to people who have never played the game, although of course I'll be going through everything. So do not watch this before you have played the game if that's what you intend to do, which I highly recommend. Honestly, go play the game and then come back and watch this. You'll want to anyway because some friends of mine have kindly volunteered to assist me in adding English voice acting to certain sections to make it creepier and also more mysterious. Ooh. In addition to what you'll be hearing in this video, we've also dubbed some full scenes, most of which will be appearing as cards throughout this video, but if you're lazy or are watching this on a TV, the links are also in the description. The voice actors also have some links down there, so if you like their dulcet tones, then please make sure to go give them a follow or even just leave a nice comment. The Discord server is where you can talk to them directly, just scream and they will appear. Probably, I, I can't tell them what to do. Finally, special, special thanks go to Claude, my wonderful associate editor who has helped immensely in the construction of these videos. If you want him to entirely take over from me like we all do, then please make sure to go check out my Patreon, as that basically equates to his paycheck at this point. Alright, alright, now I've entirely ruined the mood, let's begin. It's been a little while since chapter 1, so Claude's gonna help us out in remembering what even happened. Ready? Alright, take it away. Keiji Mahibara is a city boy who moves to the small backwater town of Hinamizawa, but unbeknownst to him, the town is under a curse. Every year on the night of the annual summer festival, someone dies and someone goes missing. This is the fifth year of the curse, which all started due to an ill-fated dam construction project that would have left the town buried underwater. This is all finally conveyed to him by a photographer from out of town named Tomatake, who is convinced that it won't happen again this year. Well, guess what? It does, and Tomatake himself is the victim. Keiji is contacted by a police officer named Oishi, who enlists his help in solving the mystery. Unfortunately, it looks like his new group of friends might be involved, whether possessed by the god of the village Oyashiro Sama or as a part of a conspiracy meant to imitate the curse. His friend Rena in particular acts exceptionally creepy, accusing him of lying to them and listening to his private conversations from right outside his bedroom door. Eventually, Keiichi learns from Oishi that Rena had broken all of the windows at a previous school and beaten three of her friends with a baseball bat before she moved to Hinamizawa, claiming that she had been in contact with Oyashiro-sama. In the end, Rena ends up chasing down Keiichi while wielding an axe, and her and their other friend Neon threaten to inject him with the same drug that killed Tomatake. He ends up killing them instead and running off into the night. Oishi, meanwhile, gets a call from Keiichi at the police station, but it becomes abundantly clear that Keiichi is now tearing out his throat, just like Tomatake. Wow. Okay. That was... Dark. So, with three of our main cast dead, how can this chapter possibly start? With a note from the author, of course. How was your taste of life in Hinamizawa? A curse or a conspiracy? I believe you have fully enjoyed everything and everyone seeming suspicious. Here at last. It is no surprise attack, but a real direct incident. Please enjoy it. The difficulty is lower than Onikikushi, but extremely vicious. The chirping of birds served as my alarm clock. Huh? Wasn't today Sunday? Why was I waking up at this disgustingly wholesome hour? So Keiichi is... alive? Apparently. 
and everything appears to be fine? His mom yells to him that he has a phone call, so he rushes down the stairs and picks up the receiver. Morning, Keiichi-kun. You're such a sleepyhead. Such a sleepyhead. What? So what's up? Hold on a second. I'll put Michan on now. Oh, hi okay, chan If I were to say that in English, that'd be good morning. What? So Rena and Mion are also still... alive? And everything is... okay again? What kind of alternate dimension have we found ourselves in? Alright, here's the deal. I could leave you in utter confusion like the novel does for the next several chapters, or I can just explain what we should be gathering from the next few scenes. If I don't tell you, you're just gonna look it up anyways. Remember in the last video when I said that each chapter of Higurashi is pretty standalone? Well, now I can finally explain. Every chapter takes place in a different timeline, essentially, with some events being the same in every one. I'm sure you can kind of guess what I'm talking about, but many being different. There are many different angles to view the mystery from, and each chapter brings up different perspectives and questions. In addition, Higurashi is split in half. The first four chapters make up the question arcs, which present a lot of the questions surrounding the general mystery, and in the second half, each chapter or answer arc corresponds to a chapter in the first half and works to answer a lot of the questions. But hedgehog, you all scream to the heavens in a choir of a thousand voices. You haven't told us why the story is like this. I mean, there's gotta be some reason why time keeps repeating itself, right? Yep, there sure is. Mion asks Keiichi if he's free today, and he agrees to meet up with the rest of the club to bike over to the neighboring city of Okinomiya. Oh yeah, what's up with doing club activities in town? It can't be that everybody's gonna put on masks and rob banks all day, is it? I wouldn't mind doing that. Even then, I wouldn't lose to you. You see, Michan always tells me the routes and schedules of the armored bank cars. I wonder why. I wonder why. Hey, Ryukishi, you just... You just had to stab me right in the heart, didn't ya? Yes, so as the timeline has reset, this first day takes place a good week and a half before the Watanagashi Festival. Again. It truly is a reset. However, we can already tell that there's a couple of differences between this timeline and the one we witnessed back in Onikakushi Hen. For one, despite this chapter beginning at almost the exact same point in time as the last one, Keiichi is apparently already a part of the club. No lengthy initiation scene required. This is obviously very narratively convenient, because I don't know many people who would want to sit through multiple scenes for a second time. At the moment, we have no idea whether it has an in-story explanation or not, but for now, it's a good idea to make note of all the differences. Keiichi, Rena, and Mion eventually make it to their destination, which turns out to be a small toy shop with a lot of children inside. Apparently, Mion put up a prize pool of 50,000 yen, about $50 in USD, for whoever wins today's event. That's the GMP of the People's Republic of Keiichi five times over! Thanks, Keiichi. Good to know you're broke as well as an idiot. They meet up with Satoko and Rika, who have been waiting for quite a while in front of the store. Mion, of course, blames Keiichi. Well, if it was Keiichi's fault, it couldn't be helped. Saying that, Rika-chan stretched up and began patting Mion's head. Hey, wait a minute. Are you solving everything by making me the bad guy? Of course! Who else but Keiichi-san could fill this important role? <laughs> Of course, they enter the toy store, see all the tables lined up in the corner, and Keiichi realizes that this is the venue for today's club activity. Surprise, Keichan! I'm good friends with the owner here. He sometimes lets me hold game tournaments to expand his customer base. So all of the other kids here are also participants today. Keiichi briefly wonders if Mion set this up as a grand grudge match from when he beat her at poker the other day. The club all gets fired up, and they keep using the damn horror sound effects that they kept hitting last chapter until they introduced the horror elements properly. It's really fucking wigging me out. The tournament begins with Mion explaining the rules. She splits the group of 15 into five tables by having them randomly select table numbers from a hat. Each table can decide to play whatever game they want, as long as the store has it, and the winner of each of those matches will go on to compete in the final round. The club members will, of course, get a more serious punishment than the outsiders if they lose. The winner will give the losers one order each. Shockingly, or maybe not so shockingly, each of the five club members ends up at a different table to start. Keiichi is paired with two younger boys that he recognizes from his class, Tomita and Okamura. Because the three can't agree on a game, who would let an opponent pick a game he's good at, they ask the store owner who brings out the game of life. The problem with that choice, he soon realizes, is that, like, life itself, 
<laughs> the game life is based entirely on luck. Keiichi begins to panic and looks over at the other club members to see how they're doing. Mion, of course, after only five minutes, has already won. It couldn't be. She'd already finished? What game was it? That easily? Rena, on the other hand, is still playing, but it looks like she might have it in the bag. She's playing Karuda, a game about picking the correct card off the table as quickly as possible. One would think that Rena would not be very good at this game, but as it turns out, the cards have Moe anime girls on them, so Rena's cute mode has become activated. So cute! So cute! Even if Rena wins, I'll still buy these cards! I'm taking them home! Hello! Satoko, meanwhile, is playing a game of memory, but it's her opponent's turn and he seems to have all the card placements memorized. Unfortunately, this is Satoko, and she's used a little sleight of hand to change the locations of the cards, proclaiming her victory. My opponent only walked into one of my traps. Even then, one was more than enough. Finally, what's Rika up to? Well, Rika's got the boys wrapped around her little finger. She's playing a magnet-powered fishing game, and, uh... Let's just say that she doesn't even really have to try to win. Wow, I caught one! Oh my, she caught another one! <laughs> Rika-chan is really good at this. Of course, Keiji, on the other hand, isn't doing so well. He's considerably behind his opponents money-wise. Mion approaches his table and seems upset by his performance, claiming he's the only one who didn't get serious about this. She turns in disgust and Keiji almost gives up, but... Come on, did you honestly expect Keiichi would miss an opportunity to scream like he's in Dragon Ball Z? I'll show you! Keiichi explains to the kids that the club members have a separate penalty, and if he wins, he can get them something better than $50. Tomura-kun, Okamura-kun, let's make a deal. Let me win. Hey, Mayubara-san, no violence. Let's settle this game properly. Just listen to what I have to say. What is it you guys want? The 50,000 yen prize? Well, of course. Winning that kind of money is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Even supposing you win, what are you going to do with that money? Buy a new game or something? Snacks? Maybe some juice? First of all, Tomita-kun. You like Satoko, right? Don't deny it. Next, Okamura-kun. You like Rika, right? Don't turn red. Lollies. Moe. What men covet. What men dream about. It's like an unreachable Garden of Eden. Tomita-kun, if I win, I'll make Satoko wear a collar and be your little sister for a day. <laughs> also, Okamura-kun. I'll put cat ears on Rika-chan, and let you take her out for a walk on a leash! Uh -huh. It was this moment that the values of men bridged generations. So, hey, Hedgehog, why did you spend five whole minutes on this stupid, stupid scene? Because it actually serves a purpose in the narrative, I promise. This is the first time we see Keiichi's true power. It's true. As I previously highlighted in this scene, each of the club members has their individual strengths that they use to help them win. Throughout the first chapter, Keiichi hasn't really had one. He's just kind of gone along with what everyone else is doing and desperately trying not to lose. But Keiichi's real strength lies in his words. Keiichi, when he tries, is really, really good at convincing people of things. We see it here first with his underclassmen, and we'll see a shining example of it again in the next chapter. Maybe eventually we'll even get to see him do it when he's not using the power of Moe on degenerates. Anyway, the gullible children he has mercilessly taken advantage of agree to surrender, and Keiichi is declared the victor. Unfortunately, just before the final round can start, Mion gets called in to work at her uncle's shop, so she has to take off. The final round will take place at a later date, it seems. Perhaps at the Watanagashi Festival for the Five Demon Firefight. The owner of the toy store comes out front to say goodbye, and as thanks for helping make the event a huge success, he gives each of them a gift. All except for Mion, because he's also her uncle and fuck her, I guess? Unfortunately, Keiichi's doesn't really match his personality very well, as it's a very beautiful china doll. He briefly considers giving it to Mion, as she doesn't have anything, but thinks to himself that it just doesn't seem like something that would suit her, so he gives it to Rena instead. Mion departs for her job, and the others proceed to make their way back to Hinamizawa. It's a good ending to a good day. For now. Of course. 
We pick up the story the next day after class as the gang prepare for yet another club activity. Today they play a party game called Sympathy in which the leader picks a topic like fish or shaved ice and each participant writes down the first thing they think of. The twist is that if you write down the same thing as someone else, you both get points, even more so if more people put down the same answer. So the goal is more to engage in groupthink and try to put down what you think everyone else will. It's a cute game. It's a cute scene. But frankly, I'm of two minds about it. The last chapter had an excuse for its multitude of club scenes. At the time, we didn't know the characters very well, and it was a good opportunity to become familiar with them in their natural environment before shit went tits up. Now, however, we pretty much know each character's shtick, and once again, a good several days are going to be mostly taken up by club activities. Basically, viewers, inside me there are two wolves. One that's a reader, and one that's a writer. As a reader, I always enjoy these scenes. I think that Ryukishi is godly at what he does, and he always imbues his characters with such charm and personality that I can probably watch them do anything. And I realize at its core that Higarashi is two types of stories combined into one, a slice of life good time and a horrifying thrill ride, and I'll be damned if somehow it doesn't work out most of the time. However, my other wolf is a writer, and from a writing perspective, this is really, really bad pacing. The main problem is that you're essentially splitting your audience in half, or at least theoretically. I don't think there are a lot of people who play Higarashi strictly because they like the slice of life sections, and if there are, they really have an incredible lack of self-awareness based on how frequently they get lambasted in the narrative. However, he always navigates the midpoint tonal shift very well, it's just simply weird how much time is spent on club activity scenes that have next to nothing to do with the main narrative. For instance, in this chapter alone, there are about three club scenes that are purely pointless fluff. And fluff is good! I like pillows just as much as the next guy, but too many and you'll end up suffocating yourself in your sleep. Regardless, the day ends with Keiichi being declared the loser and having to schlep me on stuff home while dressed as a French maid. Shortly after he gets home and scrubs all the makeup off, his mom arrives declaring that she has a headache. She asks if Keiichi and his dad can go out to eat, and his dad seems… a little… too excited at the prospect? It turns out that he's taking his son to a maid cafe. They make it to the restaurant, and after a minute, Keiichi realizes that Oishi has taken him to a maid cafe. Yes, that maid cafe. I told you it'd be important later. We learn now that its name is Angel Mort, and that its uniforms are incredibly cute. Or at least, Keiichi seems to think so. I just frankly think they're kinda ugly. His dad flags over a waitress to ask a question, and once Keiichi sees her outfit and realizes why they're there, he gets embarrassed and yells at his dad, who flees to the bathroom. Keiichi and the waitress are now alone. Um, terribly sorry for the wait. At that moment, our eyes just happened to meet. Both of us blinked, doubting who we were looking at. What? This is... Mihon? Is that you? You... Why are you working at a place like this? Uh, uh, um, I I'm helping out at my uncle's store. Keiichi sees an opportunity for a little revenge and begins to make fun of her a little. I'd say she gets her just desserts, but Mion looks so flustered and embarrassed here that it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. You can call me a hypocrite if you'd like, since I was totally fine with Keiichi being belittled while shoved into a maid outfit earlier, but I think the difference is mainly context. Keiichi willingly put himself in the situation where that could be the outcome, but Mion didn't really ask to be seen in this way at this time by Keiichi. He goes a little far in his teasing, which I think is supposed to be on purpose to make him seem like a dick, as he even questions himself right here in the moment, but for now, we're just gonna move on. Mion is obviously incredibly embarrassed and seems to start spitting out nonsense. I I'm saying that's wrong! What do you mean that's wrong? I'm. I'm not. Mion! Um, I'm sorry. I should have said this earlier, but my name is Shion Sonazaki. Mion is my older sister. Keiichi obviously believes this is a lie and a rather bad one at that, but he finally begins to realize how embarrassed he's made her and backs off. To us, Mion had to be a leader who was normally overflowing with confidence, a guiding force. If I were to lash out at that Mion, I would have ruined something I shouldn't have. So I understand. This foolishness here is something very different from the everyday Mion. That's why she's Shion. They talk for a bit about this being Shion's first day working for this particular uncle, and Keiichi asks if Mion has ever worked here before. Oh, my sister is, you see, she's not good with cutesy things. That's right. Mion's more suited for cool things. 
so I think having you help out here was the right choice. That uniform, it would never suit somebody like Mion. But for Xion, I think it works. Yeah, I don't know exactly what he's trying to say here. I think he's kind of hinting to her that he's gonna try to keep her two personas separate as it's clear she's embarrassed by her more girly side. They joke about Keiichi getting his revenge on Mion for the maid incident and the two-part ways as Keiichi's dad returns from the bathroom. As they make her way home, Keiichi wonders what he should say to Mion tomorrow about meeting Shion. The next day, the whole class engages in a curry contest for home ec. They borrow their schoolhouse space from the forestry service, so they're making the curry for them to thank them. But also, their teacher Chie is a freak who is obsessed with curry. Once again, it's another fluffy club scene, but the important thing here is that the curry also doubled as the kids' lunches, and Keiichi's was all eaten by the forestry guys, so he got no lunch. As Mio and Reta and Keiichi are walking home, he laments the fact that he is not going to get to eat until his mom makes dinner that evening. Mio takes off, mentioning that she's got her part-time job that day. Ah, that job at that Angel Mort family restaurant, huh? Being a waitress really is hard work. Eh? Michan is working as a waitress? Really? Really? What kind of place is it? How? No, I'm... Right, I'm working at that toy store from the other day. Shion is the waitress. I'm sorry, you guys look so similar I mixed you up. Mion has apparently never met Shion, and so the two have to explain to her about Mion's twin sister. We learn that no one's ever seen her because she doesn't live in Hinamizawa with Mion and their grandma, instead living at the family home in Okinomiya. Hmm. Rena's face indicated she wasn't sure if she was convinced. She was usually a bit of an airhead, but she was unusually sharp when it came to these kinds of things. But, just as well as she's able to see through Mion's bullshit, she's also able to know that she shouldn't call her out on it, and thus lets the subject drop. Keiichi finally makes it home and collapses in the entryway. Relax, my dude. You've eaten in the last 24 hours. You are not starving yet. As his consciousness is slowly slipping away, the doorbell rings. Uh, come on in. It's open. G good afternoon. Huh? Kei-chan, what are you doing? Mion, er, sorry, Shion, has stopped by to give him some food. She heard from her sister that he didn't get anything to eat for lunch, and so brought him some of the leftover curry. Is it really okay? There's not, like, a ton of hot sauce mixed in or anything, right? Ha. Ha 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 ha. Jeez, I'm not my sister. I wouldn't do that kind of thing. If you don't like it, you don't have to force yourself. I'll just go home and eat it myself. I don't mind at all. I want to chow down on it with thanks from the bottom of my heart. All right, lads. It's finally time to get crunchy on this shit. What? Actual analysis? In Hedgehog's Higarashi video? It's more likely than you think. I'd like to take a step back to look at Mion for a second. As a character. Throughout the story so far, she's been described as tomboyish, as an old man, etc. Rena has always been the girly one of the group, and up until this point, it seems like Mion has had no problem with this. But it's here in the second chapter that we finally learn that maybe this isn't always the case. In the very first scene, we can see in the background of the CG as Keiji is handing the doll to Rena that Mion looks oddly put off by it, maybe even a little jealous. And then later in the restaurant, Keiji comments that being a waitress in a revealing outfit fits Shion much better than Mion. And now, Mion is actively disguising herself as Shion to bring him food, to do something more considerate and more feminine than her Mion persona would normally do without seeming out of character. But the craziest part is, she didn't have to do this. She could have just appeared as herself to bring him some food. She would have gotten teased a little, but who really cares in the end? I think the problem might be that Mion has a lot of trouble connecting with that more feminine side of herself. Not to get too real-worldy on you here, but it is my firm belief that all men and women have masculine and feminine sides to their personality. Some sides are more dominant than others. For instance, I certainly do not consider myself a very feminine person at all. That's why I relate to Mion, but also I just sat down and forced my two best friends to play Barbie fashion show with me for my birthday and freely admit that it's a game I spent way too long on ironically playing as a child. I hang out primarily with men, that's how it's always been since I've been a kid, but sometimes I just want to hang out with the girls, you know? People are complex and oh so complicated, and I think discovering that there's more to Mion's character than her tomboyish spunk is really indicative of that. 
The fact that Mion seems uncomfortable or unable to express this side of herself really puts extra emphasis on this complexity well. And I think that Mion is a teenager who has always seen herself as more of a man, and so realizing that she has those feminine wants is a little scary, even to her. How she and the friend group will handle this going forward is a major part of this chapter's plot. Hint, it doesn't go well. Shion turns to leave, but before she goes, says one last thing. During that contest with the curry, my sister took your rice for that permission, right? My sister fools around too much, so sometimes she gets carried away. She wasn't doing it just to be mean. Hey, hey, it's not like I mind that too much. There are no grudges when it comes to club activities, after all. In fact, I should be the one that's thankful for all the thrills and entertainment. They part ways, and it's cute. It's really cute. Listen, I'm gonna level with you. Keiichi and Rena together are obviously adorable, but... I ship Mion and Keiichi way harder. And it's not just because Dragon's voicing him, shut up! For Fayad the next day, the gang decides to relax, mostly because Rika is pretty exhausted from all the practicing she's been doing for the Watanagashi Festival, and it's no fun to play without everyone. In this timeline, Keiichi still doesn't know about the Watanagashi, and once again, Mion and Rena go over what that entails. This time, however, they go into a little more detail about why it's called the Cotton Drifting Festival. I don't think there's a complicated backstory for it. The winters around here are pretty harsh, so things like warm futons and coats to ward off the cold are fairly important, I guess. In other words, it's something like giving thanks to the futons that took care of you during the winter then. So Rika's job as the Shrine Maiden is essentially to purify the futons. Later that day, Mion, Rena, and Keiichi end up discussing how different people can be from their initial appearances. <coughs> My rant wasn't for nothing, you know. <coughs> Mion gets called out by the teacher for not making any progress in her schoolwork, and Rena and Keiichi continue to talk. Appearances can be deceiving, in other words. Actually, appearance might be the opposite of reality. Are you saying that brat Satoko is actually really meek? Satoko-chan's been rude lately, but just a while ago she was pretty different. Then how about Rika-chan? Are you saying her appearance is deceiving as well? When Rika-chan grows up, I'm sure she'll become an incredibly devilish beauty with men wrapped all round her little finger. Well then, what about our dear leader Mion? But you see, even that Mi-chan is actually really feminine. Rena, how much did Mion pay you exactly? Keiichi begins to think about all of the things we discussed earlier. How Mion has always seemed boyish, and when she went out of her way to do something nice, like bring him food, she did it as Shion. The school bell rings, but before they all leave, Keiichi asks Rena one more thing. Well then, that means even Rena. Appearances can be deceiving. Would that apply to you too? Ow. Ow, my heart, my heart. Keiichi has a lot of trouble articulating what that would make Rena, but he doesn't really need to say anything, as we've already seen it firsthand. On the way home, Keiichi realizes that his keychain is missing, and Mion tells him that the staff at Angel Mort happened to find a keychain that looks identical to his the other day, so he decides to make the trek over there to pick it up. For some reason, Keiichi feels a little nervous to see Shion again, the feeling only exacerbating the closer he gets to Angel Mort. Hey, hey, what are you doing, Keiichi Maibara? You're just here to get your key back, you know? It's not like you're some love-struck schoolboy here to hand over a love letter. Ugh, the thoughts inside my head were slowly turning into a jumbled mess. In his bizarre, giddy state, he does something unbelievably stupid. A motorcycle is parked on the sidewalk, directly in his way, and he kicks it. This knocks over a whole row of motorcycles, and the owners turn out to be a group of thugs who are none too pleased with him. They threaten him, and he freezes up. Just when they're about to cut him with a knife, someone interrupts them. You're making quite the racket, you stupid pieces of trash! Get out of my sight! Mion, I mean, Shion, is standing at the end of the alley, looking like she's about to murder a bitch. Yas girl, slay. I'll only say this one more time. Let go of Keichan and get lost. This only serves to make the thugs angrier, and obviously Shion can't really do anything to stop them. But wait, maybe she can. To the surprise of all, a group of people slowly starts to gather around the thugs. But the strange part is, they are all of different ages and genders. Businessmen, housewives, even an old lady. Keiichi recognizes a few of the kids as his classmates, and realizes that the one thing they have in common is that they are all residents of Hinamizawa. 
The thugs are panicking, but no one else says a word. They just encircle them and stare. All right, all right, all right. What's going on here? What's going on? Hey, it's our boy. He's back. It seems that in the chaos, someone in the crowd called the police, and boy howdy, they sure got there fast. Oh, officer, good timing. There you go, the extortionists, caught red-handed. Please arrest them. The police obey Shion's command and arrest the thugs immediately, even if they really haven't done anything wrong yet. The detective returns to the crowd and addresses everyone. Thank you, citizens, for your timely report. Thanks to your efforts, we were able to keep the peace today. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Thank you for your hard work, Detective Oishi. It's an honor for a detective from the First Division to come out all this way. It was a coincidence. I happened to hear the call over the radio on my way back from the prefectural office. I just made a little detour. This is clearly a lie from what we know of Oishi, but we're gonna let that slide for now. As soon as the police leaves, Shion snaps her fingers, smiles, and the tension from the crowd melts. They all ask if Keiji is okay and slowly disperse, at which point Shion offers to treat him at Angel Mort while he picks up his key. As they walk over, Shion mentions that if he ever sees someone in trouble, he should help out too, as that sort of thing is highly valued around these parts. But the way I was rescued just now, something seemed a little off about that. While I was helped out, it was honestly to an almost disturbing degree. Later, in the restaurant, Shion treats Keiichi to iced coffee and pancakes, and after telling a little white fib to her uncle that it was Keiichi who saved her, she gets a couple of minutes off to talk to him. Shion, really. Thank you. I was thanking Shion, but I really wanted to thank Mion. Mion, really. Thank you. <laughs> now, now, cheer up a little. If you feel indebted, then when you have the chance, you should help somebody in need. Like, for example, if I'm ever in trouble, please come and save me. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. It's a promise. So if I'm ever in trouble, Kei-chan will come and save me. I hope trouble comes soon. <laughs> you finally smiled. A downshot in Kei-chan is as good as an imposter. They go on to talk for a few minutes about this and that while they eat their pancakes, and as they do, Keiichi suddenly becomes conscious of the fact that Shion is a girl. Something that never happens with Mion. Which is weird, because they're actually the same person, right? Seemingly reading his mind, Shion asks him a strange question. If both her and her sister were dangling off a cliff, who would he save? Keiichi thinks that's a silly question, as Mion wouldn't get herself in that situation in the first place, so he answers Shion. She tries to respond with something, and Keiichi doesn't quite understand what she's saying, so she abruptly changes the subject. They start talking about the crowd that gathered to help Keiichi, and again in this timeline, it's actually Shion who tells him all about the dam project. Once again, it's mostly stuff we know, but there are a couple of new pieces of info. In the last chapter, Mion stated very firmly that there were no violent protests, but here, Shion tells us a different story. Apparently, the protesting was so bad that riot police had to get involved. My Nana went off like a firework. After that, it was amazing. Like a full-scale war, we weren't just going to sit by and idly file complaints. We went on the offensive. They created propaganda. They hired scientists to claim the land was a nature preserve. They did everything they possibly could to prevent the dam project from going through. And in the end, of course, they caused such a big stink that the government decided it was not worth it and canceled the project. And to this day, that sense of unity that was fostered in Hinamizawa still hasn't faded. Shion gets called back to the floor, and Keiichi decides to head home. Oh, Mion. Thanks a lot for today. I owe you one. If you really think that, then return the favor. I'm looking forward to it. Clearly, she hasn't realized that he accidentally called her Mion. Later that night, Keiichi gets a call from a Sonazaki-san. Thinking it's Mion, he answers the phone in a boisterous manner, only to realize that it's actually Shion. That's right. Um, good evening. I'm sorry for calling so late. No, it's fine. What's up? She tells him about a dessert festival that's happening at Angel Mort over the summer. Apparently, every year they get a new dessert menu, and every year they hire taste testers. It's, for obvious reasons, very difficult to get accepted, but Shion has claimed Keiichi a spot if he wants it. He can come in tomorrow and eat all the dessert he wants for free. Shion also says that her shift ends early, so after she's done, maybe they could go take a walk or something. Keiichi is far too dense to realize that she's probably asking him out on a date. He's a visual novel protagonist. What did you expect? 
Regardless of date status, Keiji is super happy to be eating dessert all afternoon, and as they walk home from school the next day, his pleasure is so noticeable that his friends start to question him about it. Yeah, I got a little lucky. I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Rena, you'll definitely be jealous. Shion didn't tell him much about the ticket, but presumably it's for one person, so Keiji decides to tell her about it after the fact so she isn't too upset. Mion brushes off the dessert festa as the answer as Keiji hadn't moved yet when the drawing occurred, and mentions that the tickets are so prized that they're actually being sold on the black market. Keiji feels a little bad as this is now another thing he owes Shion. He decides to thank her later. Mion takes off to her part-time job, and Rena comments that she seems really happy about something. However, the smile falls off her face abruptly. But you see, lately, she's been in a lot of pain. When Keiichi questions her about this, however, Rena becomes very vague and then makes herself dizzy from spinning too much, so the subject gets dropped and not brought back up again. Keiichi makes it to the dessert festa and struggles to even get into the damn building because of the mob gathered outside. Turns out one ticket is actually good for four people, and since Keiichi is going by himself, he almost doesn't make it with his life intact. Inside is frankly, not much better. The degenerate otakuism is on full display. As one of the waitresses explains, Our restaurant is pretty famous in their circles. Well, we were aiming for that, so it's all well and good. But during festas, they are something of a more hardcore crowd. So it can be a handful. Just as Keiji is fully taking in this disgusting display, there's a large crash. A waitress has fallen down and spilled some food right on a customer's pants. And of course, it turns out to be Shion. Uh, I'm so sorry. Your food is, uh, uh. How tragic. It seems that little Miss Waitress here will have to wipe you, wipe it up from the bottom of her heart. Clearly, this douche canoe made her trip on purpose. That's so not cool. And on top of that, it looks like none of the other wait staff can help her. That's the service industry for you. Remember to tip your fucking wait staff. Keiji struggles with himself. She came in to save him when he needed her, but it's not as if her life is at stake or anything, right? Keiji, stop being a fucking prick and get in there. Shut up, you greasy fat ass. Get out of here before I get angry. He then proceeds to get the absolute shit kicked out of him. All right, that's it. It's time to call in the cavalry. His ticket is good for four people, and Keiichi knows where he can find three willing pranksters easily. He grabs the phone in the restaurant, and then approaches one of the waitresses. Please add Rena Ryugu, Sotoko Hojo, and Rika Furude to the guest list. They arrive a few minutes later. Th this is a nice restaurant! Ooh, the uniforms are cute! Rena wants to wear them too, huh? On top of that, we're being treated to dessert. I'm deeply moved. Keiichi's on enough with the charades, let's get to the point. Keiichi explains the situation, including that this is Shion and not Mion, and the gang immediately formulates a plan. Thus, the most powerful warband the world had ever known, trained by Mion, began to move. First, Rena accompanies Shion on her trip around the restaurant. As she's entranced by the uniforms and has entered Qit mode, the laws of physics simply don't apply. When more otaku goons try to stick their legs out to trip Shion again, Rena kicks them. Ooh, Keiichi kun, this is Rena. There's nobody left that'll bother Shichan, so I'm going to take her home now. Rena, this is Keiichi. Good work. Please continue the mission. Also, permission to take home denied. And I'll just look. I'll just look! Oh. Next, Keiichi checks in with Satoko, who is currently in the kitchen, and her part of the plan is also proceeding well. Soon, some more desserts emerge onto the floor. It seems now as well that the staff are beginning to collude with the kids and are actively helping them execute their plan. A minute later, every person who tried to mess with Shion starts getting antsy. They all stand as one, and their eyes lock onto one particular place in the restaurant. The bathroom. Satoko... What did you mix in there? It couldn't have been salt or Tabasco, right? My, what are you saying, keiichi san You said no mercy. I might not look like it, but when I get down to business, I like to be very thorough. Keiichi follows the men to the bathroom, wondering just what Rika plans to do. 
The men's bathroom ends up being utterly trashed, so they all wander over to the ladies, and inside they meet the judgmental stare of the most adorable of little girls. Rika claims she knows where they can find a bathroom, so they all follow Rika to the door like good little lambs, but before they go, Keiichi stops them. You know what happens if you even set one foot outside this door, right? <laughs> Look! It's written right here on the ticket. Not valid for re-entry, see? Unfortunately, they don't have much choice in the matter. Everybody follows Rika outside, cursing all the way. We return! Shion realizes what they did for her and thanks them profusely, even if she's pretty embarrassed. And then everyone clapped. No, seriously, that's what they do. It might not seem like it, but this is a pretty important part of the story. Up till now, all we've seen are the club members playing games against each other, but now as they put their skills to the test in a real-world scenario, we can actually see that Mion has honed them into a well-oiled machine. In addition, it's fun to see them all work together to see some gross pigs get their just desserts. Ha. Huh. I hope no one in the audience is offended by the otaku stereotype, but if you are, uh, you might need to give yourself a good hard look. Just saying. The gang hangs out for a little while and fills out the surveys at the end of the festa, then Rika and Satoko head home. Rena stays a little longer, however, and Keiichi takes the opportunity to ask her about their conversation earlier. Rena, you said it today, right? That Mion was hurting? As she continues to be somewhat reticent, Keiichi comes to the conclusion that it must be because of something he did. If something like that happened, it's not something I did out of malice. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't think Keiichi-kun had any bad intentions, it's just that... How do I say this? It's hard. I, I don't think Keiichi-kun made a mistake. Depending on how you look at it, Michon might be the one who's being unfair. I'm begging you, Rena. Mion is one of my best friends. I don't want to leave something between us that could cause problems later on. So tell me, how did I hurt her? I can't tell you. You need to realize something like this for yourself. Keiichi still insists, so Rena gives him a cryptic hint. Shi-chan, if she ties her hair up, is impossible to tell apart from Mi-chan, right? So if Mi-chan let down her hair, would she be impossible to tell apart from Shi-chan? What if that her being the younger twin was a lie? That she was just Mi-chan pretending to be her sister? What would you think? But... If, like you say, Mion is just pretending to be Shion, what purpose would that serve? That's what I want you to think about. Rena then states that she has a few errands to run before she gets home and heads out, and so Keiichi is left alone for a few minutes until Shion finishes up. They leave the restaurant together and end up meandering over to the train station. Shion turns and decides to reintroduce herself since she was mistaken for her sister the first time they met. My name is Shion Sonazaki. I am only similar to my older sister in appearance. My sister is rough around the edges and hot-headed, but I am a composed and methodical person. This difference between them reminds Keiichi of what Rena told him and how it has something to do with how he hurt her. He continues to think about this as they proceed to go window shopping around Okinomiya. Keichan, is this your first time doing this kind of thing? Yeah, it is. If somebody didn't bring me into these accessory shops, I don't think I'd set foot in one my entire life. Not that. I meant more like this. She links her arm with his and, yeah, surprise! It's a date! Who would have thought? Keiichi is surprised but doesn't necessarily turn her down. Slowly, it's beginning to dawn on him. Shion wrapping her arm around him is cute. If Mion did it, he'd be worried about when she's going in for the headlock. Shion is girly and cute. Mion is boyish and rude. Or... At least that's how Keiichi has been seeing her. They end up at the toy shop from the competition the past weekend, and there in the window are some dolls. Shion asks Keiichi which one he thinks is the cutest, almost as if she's trying to hint something to him. That's right, Keiichi was given one of these dolls after the contest, but he didn't think it suited him, so he gave it to someone else. Mion didn't get anything at all, but still, he gave it to Rena, because he didn't think something like that suited Mion. Do you get it? Do you get it now, Keiichi? We've all been screaming this at you for about 10 minutes now. Jesus Christ, get your shit together. Keiichi flashes back to all the really awkward things he said about Mion and Shion, and he realizes that he's been an utter douche canoe. 
In order to make it up to her, he decides to waltz into that toy shop and buy the doll for Shion. Okay, Mion. As thanks for today, I'll buy you whichever one you want. But, but I'm not Mion, I'm Shion. Shion, then. I'll buy it for you, Shion. He runs into the store, highly embarrassed, with Shion right behind him, and proclaims to the clerk that he'd like to buy the doll in the window. But when he finally looks up, he's met with a horrible surprise. k chan And why are you here? This has nothing to do with you. I'm on a date with k chan right now. <sighs> what is going on? Tell me, Shion! Not much. I was wondering what kind of person this Kei-chan you were so infatuated with was, so I happened to give him a ticket to the dessert festa. There, when I was being bothered by all sorts of troublesome customers, Kei-chan gallantly appeared and saved me by kicking them all to the curb. Yeah, so it turns out that Shion and Mion are two different people. So wait. All those nice things, all those fun conversations, were they actually with Shion? The real Shion? The whole time? Mmm, no. The game never makes this particularly clear, but from inference, it seems as if everything up to Shion inviting him to the dessert festa really was Mion. The younger sister gloats for a few minutes and then has a family car brought over to ferry Keiichi home. Both him and Mion are still utterly confused and embarrassed. So, yeah, I guess we've properly met Shio now, and it turns out that, frankly, she's kind of a bitch. She clearly knew about her sister's feelings towards Keiichi and decided to take advantage of the situation by placing herself firmly in the middle. All I gotta say, Keiichi's gonna have a rough one at school tomorrow. In fact, most of it is dedicated to dealing with the fallout of the previous night. Rena attempts to run damage control, asking Keiichi to ignore Mion for the day while they figure things out, to which he agrees. Rena spends all day with Mion, and Satoko and Rika try to comfort Keiichi during lunch. At the end of the day, Rena approaches Keiichi with a message from Mion. She asks that Keiichi just forget about the whole incident. Keiichi feels a little bad about not being able to apologize, but agrees. Hey, just, uh want to pop in here and say that as an adult human being with more life experience than these children, I know that this is not a healthy way to deal with this situation. Okay, moving on. The three classmates walk home together as usual, and Mion mentions that she's going to be helping set up the Watanagashi Festival tonight. Keiichi, perhaps in an attempt to apologize, offers to help as well, and the two agree to hopefully run into each other at the shrine grounds. Keiichi makes it there, sweats his ass off for the afternoon while all the old men brag about how excellent the beer's gonna be afterwards. Um, I'm a minor. Unfortunately, he really doesn't run into Mion, only catching a brief glimpse and conversation with her. So when Keiichi runs into Shion, who brings him a cup of cold tea, and Mion finds the both of them together, it's, uh, not really a good look. Sh shion Why are you hanging out with Keichon again?! Because unlike you, I'm very considerate. Keichan was so sweaty, I couldn't leave him alone, so I brought him some tea. <laughs> By the way, why are you holding two cups of tea? There's no way you, such a rough, timid, good sister of mine, would ever briskly bring a male classmate tea, is there? Jesus Christ, Shion is a demon. After essentially forcing Mion to drink both cups of tea herself out of embarrassment, the three run into some familiar faces. You should remember them, right? They were pretty damn important in the last chapter. Keiichi hasn't met them in this timeline yet, so after getting reintroduced, Takano of course ends up bringing up the curse. Mion tries desperately to pull Keiichi away from the conversation, but ultimately his curiosity is piqued and she goes to wait for him in the refreshments tent. So, once again, it's up to Tomotake and Takano, with some help from Shion this time, to fill Keiichi in on the story of Oyashiro-sama's curse. As with most of the repeat info this chapter, we already know most of this from our previous encounter with the curse, and so if you really don't remember, then just go back, watch that section of the first video again, and give me even more watch time, thank you! But there's a couple of interesting details added to the explanation. Takano, it turns out, is somewhat of an amateur scholar on the ancient legends of Hinamizawa, which is why she knows so much about all of this. 
First of all, the people of Hinamizawa might in some ways consider themselves a chosen people because of their worship of their god, and so in the old days they cut themselves off from the rest of the tainted world pretty effectively. This could explain some of the rumors of demons living up in the mountains we heard from Oishi in the previous chapter. Both Takano and Shion, it turns out, don't believe that the curse itself exists, but that some splinter group from the damn opposition forces is enacting it on the enemies of their cause. But why make someone vanish in addition to killing? Well, actually, Hinamizawa has this one really old legend. It's about how people offer sacrifices to Oyashiro-sama to calm his wrath. They say they used to wrap a living person up in a bamboo mat and let them slowly sink down into a bottomless swamp. Alright, so now we have one or two questions from the last chapter answered, but now there's about 50 extra questions we can ask. Eventually, Tomotake, Takano, and Shion all bid Keiichi goodnight, and he goes to find Mion, only to discover that she's already left. He made her wait too long. God, Keiichi, you really need to stop being a little bitch to Mion, alright? Holy shit! The next day is, of course, the Watanagashi, and this time we limit our faffing about and cut right to Keiichi meeting up with Rena and Mion. Like last time, they all walk to the shrine together and find Satoko and Rika. This time, the game they play is a little different. It entails running up to food booths and seeing who can sell whatever the vendor is offering to the crowd the most effectively. Keiichi is obviously a shoe in for this, being able to sell takoyaki with hardly any octopus with a moving speech. At one point, of course, Shion shows up, pokes fun at Mion, and then promptly fucks off, cackling that she'll return. Shortly thereafter, the ceremony begins, and in an effort to get a good spot to see Rika, Keiichi gets separated from his friends. Worst of all, he suffers the bane of short people everywhere. He can't see shit. Keichan, over here! Shion, what's up? Shh, just be quiet and follow me. Thinking she must be leading him to a better viewing spot, he follows her. But, of course, once again, he misreads the situation, and Shion actually takes him to a deserted part of the shrine grounds. Keiichi thinks she might be planning something crazy, <laughs> but actually she's spying on two other people who turn out to be Tomotake and Takano. Keiichi argues with Shion, angry that she's led him away from Rika's dance, but they whisper too loudly, and Takano hears them. Well, hello there. The moon sure is beautiful tonight, isn't it? My, my. If it isn't Shion-chan and Mayabara-kun. Good evening. Yes, the moon certainly is pretty. As it turns out, the two adults are not meeting for a romantic rendezvous, but rather are trying to break into the ritual storehouse behind them. I don't know about you, but that sounds like my kind of date. The storehouse is apparently full of ritual implements that were used in the past, for example, the hoe that Rika was using for the Watanagashi, which was stored here. Obviously, because of this, it's forbidden for any old schmucks to just enter it, but Takano wants to see what's in there for her research, whatever that entails. Tomotake is just here to undo the lock. Why does a photographer have lockpicking skills? And Takano goes inside to look around. She offers to show Keiichi and Shion, and after Keiichi hesitates, the two agree. Okay. Look, I'm gonna be honest here, there's a lot of info that gets dropped this next scene, and honestly, there's no way I'm ever gonna be able to replace the original just on pure creep factor, but you're in luck because this is of course one of the scenes we've dubbed through, at least the important parts. So please do yourself a favor, even if you don't watch them, make this your one exception, I promise it's gonna be worth it. For those of you who are still here for some reason, I'm gonna give you the Cliff Notes version, like the bare minimum information you need to keep up. As it turns out, the ritual implements are all torture devices. Watanagashi didn't always mean cotton drifting, as the Wata can also be translated as guts to make it gut spilling festival. Takano tells the two teenagers one of the oldest legends of Hinamizawa. Back when it was still called Onigafuchi, a horde of demons emerged from the bottomless swamp, said to be a gateway to hell, and attacked the village, but the villagers refused to leave. They called upon their god Oyashiro sama for help, and he interceded on their behalf. The demons had been banished from hell and had nowhere to go, so Oyashiro Yashiro sama brokered a peace between the two, and the demons lived alongside the villagers, eventually bearing offspring and technically dying out. Now, however, every villager from Hinamizawa has the blood of man-eating demons running through their veins, and so for many, many years they had a tradition of committing onikakushi, going down to neighboring villages and kidnapping people to use in their hideous rituals of the original Watanagashi, torture followed by the consumption of the victim. But this is all in the far past, right? 
not true. In the past century, there were news reports of a potential Onikikuchi victim who had his skin peeled off his body and lashes on the remaining flesh. Yikes. While Takano tells them the story, she continues to be creepy and overexcited about all of this. What? I don't relate to Takano at all. Shut up. Eventually, just when Keiichi starts to become genuinely frightened, Tomatake pops his head in to tell them that the festival is almost done and they should leave to avoid being caught. Once everybody's out, he places the padlock in place and everything looks exactly as it should. Takano keeps looking back at the storehouse, however, even as Tomatake is leading her away. He questions her, asking her if it isn't enough to have seen it once. No, oh, not at all. Everything I found only renewed my interests. All those stories and legends suddenly hold water. After today, I'm going to have to change the way I look at all this. I am disappointed in how much I relate to this character. The two adults take off, but Keiichi and Shion hold back a little. My sister is the type that gets really jealous. If she knew I was hogging you this whole time, she'd never let me hear the end of it. So keep tonight a secret, okay? Not only because of that, either. Considering what we were doing tonight, we really need to keep it a secret. Oyashiro-sama's curse might happen tonight, and we four would be the prime candidates. After saying a few more confusing things about the relationship between the two sisters, Shion gets up to leave, but says one last thing before she does. Seriously though, what was that sound anyway? Huh? What sound? I mean, I'm with you buddy, we never heard a sound in there, if you don't count talking to his panting. The banging sound. It was like a kid was jumping up and down on floorboards somewhere far away. It really didn't bother you? That can't be true. Don't start trying to scare me after all that. Please don't try to scare me either, Keichan. You and Takano-san weren't paying any attention to it at all, so I pretended not to hear either, but you heard it, right? It happened a bunch of times, and it was really loud. When it's clear Keiichi really didn't hear anything, however, she backtracks and said that she was just joking all along. Even Keiichi, who is deaf, dumb, and blind, can tell that she's lying. After she leaves, he muses to himself that he remembers Tomatake also saying something about a banging noise, so maybe it was real after all. But in that case, how could he have not heard it? Suddenly, Rika, Mion, and Rena approach him. It's clear that everyone got split up during Rika's ceremony because they're still looking for Satoko. The group goes to show Keiichi how to float the cotton down the river like he's supposed to, but Mion briefly stops him. Hey, Keichan. Did you see Shion? Keiichi's little heart freezes, and for a second he thinks she knows where he's really been this whole time. He denies it vehemently, but it almost looks like Mion's going to call him out on it. I just can't do anything about that Shion. Well, it's her we're talking about, so we can just leave her be. Keiichi's gotten off scot-free for now, but as we no doubt know, this is the night of Wata Nagashi. The night where everything changes. When he gets up the next morning, Keiji has a little trouble keeping his eyes open. It turns out he was up far too late last night. That banging noise. Like a child far away. The story wouldn't get out of my head, so I had trouble sleeping. It seems that Rena has had a lot of trouble sleeping too, but that was just from the excitement of the festival. Upon seeing happy, cheerful Rena, Keiichi muses on just how fucked up it seems the history of Hinamizawa is. Rena interrupts his thoughts, however. Where's Michan? She's late. Keiichi's thoughts immediately jump to the worst place, that there's supposed to be another victim of Oyashirosama's curse. Luckily, she's not dead, just late. We all know who the real victim is this year, after all. She seems oddly out of breath, however, and Rena looks concerned. Michan, you're a little bit warm. It's no big deal. Give it half a day and I'll be fit as a fiddle. Are you really okay? Y you don't have to push yourself, you know. What's this? Keichan, are you worried about me? <laughs> That's nice of you. Who are you and what have you done to Mion? I'm kidding, of course, but Mion must really not be feeling very well. Even Keiichi comments to himself how much that answer isn't like her. They head to school, and as the day passes, Keiichi has trouble keeping awake. The teacher ends up telling him to go wash his face, so he wakes up, and he elects to do it at the sinks out front of the building. I knew you'd choose these sinks, Keichan. The ones out front just feel better, don't they? Mion, how's your cold doing? She laughs. As it turns out, she got caught up in a party her relatives were having and is not nursing a cold, but rather a hangover. 
I gotta say, when I first read this, I was a little surprised. Anime is usually so puritanical about having minors drink. I can see why, of course, most anime airs on public television. You can't have minors watching and thinking that's okay behavior. America. To be honest, I don't really care about teenagers drinking as long as it's done responsibly, and I think it's a little refreshing to have a story that just lets its teenagers be more realistic. Obviously, it's due to its format as an individual novel, and I don't have much more to say on the matter, only that, at least as a Western viewer, letting the Sonozaki sisters drink with their families throughout the course of the story lends a little more realism to me. Then again, I'm also from Wisconsin, so maybe that's just a me thing. Mion's going to head home to sleep it off, and Keiichi turns to head back to the classroom, but before he does, Mion stops him. Oh, one more thing, Keichan. Last night, near the end of the festival, did you see Tomotake-san or Takano-san anywhere? Ah, shit. If I could, I wanted to forget about sneaking into the storehouse that night as soon as possible. Besides that, though, why was Mion asking me a question like that? W well, maybe? I might have seen them around. I don't know. Real smooth, my man. What on earth happened to that smooth motherfucker from the start of the story? I want him back. I see. Then, one more question. On that same night, did you see Shion? Fuck, 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 fuck. I suddenly noticed something in Mion's eyes. Something indescribable. There was no doubt about it. Last night, the four of us snuck into the ritual storehouse. She knew everything. Keiichi questions Mion a little, and she claims that she only heard a couple of people speaking ill of the four of them, and she wanted to see if he was alright. Keichan, you weren't with Tomatake-san, Takano-san, or Shion, right? Um, yeah. That's good. I'll have to tell them. You weren't involved in anything bad, Keichan, so I'll make sure to tell everyone. To everyone? Make sure... everyone. Everyone? Who is everyone? Okay, later. I'll be better tomorrow. Bye-bye. The teacher calls him back inside, and he doesn't get a chance to ask Mion what she meant. Keiichi, you haven't seemed well all day. It's clearly because he had far too much fun yesterday. I don't want to be told that by the one who got lost. Your face was all red and you were nearly crying. S satoko was so... So cute last night! It seems his friends have noticed his downturn mood, but it doesn't look like they're going to be able to shake it. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like he's going to be able to get in some nice stress relief anytime soon because his mom wants him to run to the Okinomiya library to return some books she checked out. It seems both his parents are waiting for a phone call. This is the 80s, remember? Shion ends up giving him a call right before he's going to leave, ticking off his parents. She says she has something she needs to talk to him about, so he proposes she show him where the library is and they'll talk there. Even though she's a little better at hiding it, it seems like Shion had a little too much to drink last night too. They quickly find the library and end up talking about this and that while enjoying the air conditioning. Keiichi discovers that Mion and Shion don't actually live together. Mion lives at the main house and I live in Okinomiya. What do you mean by main house? You make it sound like you're nobility. It's just the main house, the Sonozaki family's main house. Mion's the successor, so she lives with Nana and apparently studies all sorts of things as preparation to be the head of the family. Keiichi is really confused. As it turns out, the Sonozaki family is pretty influential around here. They run a bunch of businesses throughout Hinamizawa and Okinomiya and have a lot of feelers in the government. Kinda crazy. Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> Welp, time for everything to go to shit. Once again, Oishi, the police officer, promptly enters our story, and you know this is where everything starts to go downhill. Hello. Good afternoon. Are you on a date today? Ah, what I would give to be young again. If you thought we were on a date, then why are you bothering us? As soon as Oishi sits down, kind of just barging in uninvited, Shion looks up at the clock and says she has to get to her job. Keiichi is confused because he thought she had something she wanted to talk to him about, but she says she'll call him later and takes off like a rocket. Now Oishi and Keiichi are alone. The police officer buys Keiichi a tea from the vending machine and asks him what he knows about the Sonozaki family. Other than what I heard just now, nothing. The Sonozakis are a syndicate with this entire region under their thumb. 
Did you know that? She'd mentioned me on being a successor, but to a crime syndicate? Not at all, not at all. A boring old syndicate isn't the only thing Mio and Sonozaki will inherit. She's inheriting the Sonozaki family itself. I'll leave you to mull over what exactly that means. So, remember in the last chapter when Oishi tried and succeeded in turning Keiichi against his friends? Well, looks like the boy is back at it again! This time, however, Keiichi isn't swayed so easily. Whatever family Mion is from, doesn't change the fact that she's the best friend I could ever have. And I'm proud of that. I don't appreciate people speaking ill of her. Oishi then brings up the idea that Mion might not be the sweet, innocent girl that Keiichi knows. If there were to be, say, a series of incidents in the area, then the Sonozaki family would be one of the first groups suspected, and Mion is right in the middle of it. Oishi claims that he's not trying to suspect Mion, rather he's trying to clear her of any wrongdoing, but Keiichi is by this point tired of the runaround. Oishi-san, do you need something from me? Yes, I do, Keiichi Maibara-san. But as it turns out, he actually didn't come to Keiichi as a friend of Mion's, but rather as his own entity, and this whole conversation immediately turns into an interrogation. Last night during the festival, did you see Jiro Tomotake-san in Mio Takano-san? So this is the second time he's been asked that today, once again, Keiichi gives a vague answer, and once again, Oishi doesn't seem satisfied. Why is he asking me the same thing Mion did? We snuck into the ritual storehouse. A punishable act. While it may not count for much now, I, I do feel sorry about it. Clearly not getting an answer out of him, Oishi asks him a different question. On the same night of the festival, did you see Shion Sonozaki-san? Keiichi shrugs the question off. He might have seen her, but honestly she looks just like Mion, so it might not have been. But Oishi grabs him by the shoulders and hits him with a piercing gaze. Mion-san and Shion-san wear completely different clothing. You wouldn't mistake the two so easily, I would think. So, yeah, it seems like sneaking into that storehouse might have been a worse idea than Keiichi thought, now that a fucking police officer is asking him about it. Fortunately, before Keiichi says anything, a younger man approaches Oishi. Looks like the library's closing. Well then, my Barakun, I'd like to talk with you more about this at your leisure. When we have more time. This isn't a joke. If I never saw him again, it would be too soon. Oh, right. My Barasan. Just so you know, you saw them all yesterday, near the stone steps. I saw you with my own eyes. We'll meet again. Have a good year. On the way back home, as he listens to the cries of the Higarashi, Keiichi reflects on his stupid, stupid decisions. Yeah, you thought that maybe he'd be better this chapter? Nope, Keiichi is just full of awful thought processes. The storehouse for ritual implements. Hollowed ground, only accessible to the family of the priest. For sure, I'd seen terrifying things that I'd never imagined would be there. Did we do something so bad? Really, it doesn't matter how wrong it was. I did something wrong. And yet, he still can't bring himself to tell the truth to the police, or to Mion. He apologizes to himself, but personally, I don't think that's gonna make anything better there, pal. Allow me to take a brief aside, as I tend to do. Another aspect of Higurashi's writing I really enjoy, which I've touched on briefly, is how well the teenage characters are written. When you're a teenager, you're an idiot. I've been an idiot, you've been an idiot, there are probably plenty of teenagers watching right now who are currently being idiots. And as much as I've poked fun, there's nothing wrong with that. Part of being a teenager is learning to grow into your adult brain, learning how to treat your fellow peers like human beings, learning from your parents or from their mistakes. Everyone fucks up when they're a teenager and everyone goes about things in the wrong way. It reminds me a lot of Neon Genesis Evangelion. A common complaint I see constantly for the original series is how much people hate Shinji, how he's a whiny protagonist who won't just get in the damn robot. People seem to forget that Shinji is goddamn 14 years old. I'd be a little fucking scared to get in the giant robot if I was him too. He's written not as a shitty protagonist, but as a child. I think more stories with teenage characters need to write their teenage characters as what they are. 
children. Higurashi does this in spades. A lot of the problems we've seen in the last chapter, and especially this one, comes from poor communication on the part of the characters. When the whole doll incident happens, instead of talking about their feelings and figuring out their friendship, Keiichi and Mion both try to forget that it ever happened, which might seem like an easier solution, but as we'll soon see, you can't just forget something happened, no matter how hard you try. I'll go home, go to my room, put on my favorite music or something, and go to bed. Oh my god, he's not listening to me. Keiichi's plan gets interrupted by a phone call from a Sonozaki-san. It seems that even if he wants to forget his problems, they don't want to forget him. Hello? Is that you, Shion? Hello. Ran into a bit of trouble today, didn't we? Finally, Shion can tell him about what she intended to earlier that day, but it seems like after his conversation with Oishi, Shion assumes he already knows. Sorry, but I have no clue what you're talking about. She mentions the Watanagashi Festival, and Keiichi's hair stands on end. Somehow, he knows what she's about to ask him. You mean, did I see Tomotaki-san and Takano-san last night? The two of them question each other, wondering if the other might have something to do with the curse, but Shion was with relatives the whole night, and Keiichi was with the club members, so they relax. And Shion finally tells him why everyone's been asking him that question all day. Apparently, last night... Takano-san and Tomatake-san died. Sorry, Shion. What was that you just said? Takano-san was found burned to death. Tomatake-san was... Well, it looked like a suicide. I found out this morning. Shion goes on to confirm that his death was by clawing at his own throat. So this confirms two things. Number one, Tomatake died the same way in this chapter that he did in the last. And number two, if that's the case, then Takano probably didn't really just go missing last chapter either. Takano's body was found in the mountains of Gifu Prefecture. The cause of death wasn't confirmed, but it was highly likely to have been a homicide. The oil drum had fallen over, so it's also possible she burned herself to death. Keiichi reacts in much the same way he did the last chapter, by initially expressing his disbelief and horror, even though the effect is somewhat muted this time as we all knew this was coming. After calming down, the two realize that this is Oyashiro-sama's curse for the year, but there's something a little strange. This year, there are two victims, which means there will need to be two Onikikushi sacrifices. Two people have yet to disappear? Neither of us could say anything. If two more people were to be sacrificed, then they would be none other than the ones who entered with them. None other than us. Keiichi begins to freak out, questioning Shion and making an ass of himself, as no doubt she is just as terrified. She tries to calm him down, but he just gets more and more agitated. I didn't have any interest in any of this from the start, dammit. All I wanted to do was watch Rika-chan's performance. You were the one who pulled me away from that, weren't you, Shion? That's right. You're the one who made me go in there in the first place, Shion! There's a small click. Shion has hung up the phone. Keiji immediately regrets screaming at her, but realizes that he doesn't actually know her phone number, so he can't call her back. He sits in front of the phone, hoping she'll call back. It does end up ringing, but it's only someone named Kimiyoshi wondering if Keiji's family has seen her father. And so he continues his silent vigil. However, no matter how long I waited, the phone didn't ring again that night. Keiichi stays awake most of the night waiting for Shion to call back, but she never does, and he wakes up the next morning feeling like death. And yet, he still must make the trek to school. Keiichi-kun, you don't look so good today. Do you have a cold? Rena tries to cheer up a despondent Keiichi, but to no avail. As it turns out, Mion didn't sleep much last night either. What? Wait, is it about the mayor? He still hasn't been found? Nope. Hey, wait a minute. What are you talking about? You can't find the mayor? Yep, you know that girl calling to ask about her father last night? That was the mayor's daughter. The mayor has been missing since last night. Overhearing some of the other kids at lunch, Keiichi puts together a basic timeline. Yesterday night, the mayor went to a meeting at the Shrine's Assembly Hall. It was already late, and Hinamizawa doesn't have a lot of lights outside. Nobody saw the mayor after the meeting. Half the village spent the previous night searching for him. The only thing that came to mind was... the curse. The rumors of Onikakushi, of the demoning away. If Tomotaki-san and Takano-san had suffered mysterious deaths, 
Then it should have been mine and Xion's turn next. As he's musing, he overhears some classmates whispering to each other. Apparently, the same thing happened last year to a young man named Satoshi. It seems that he withdrew his entire savings and hopped on a train at Nagoya Station, or so the rumors go. Though they try to have a nice lunch, the club fails miserably. All their thoughts continue to return to the mayor. At one point, someone asks where Mion went, and Rena assumes she's just taking a nap somewhere. The mayor was a pretty important person in her life, it seems. When Michan was really little, the mayor would always spoil her. When she was going through her prankster phase, he loved her like his own daughter. She's told me that often. After he's done with his lunch, it's Keiichi's job today to water all of the flowers around the school. But as he makes his way around the back of the building, he comes across something strange. Oh! It's Rika-chan. Don't scare me like that. Rika was just standing there like a puppet, devoid of life. Her expression was clearly abnormal. There was red under her eyes, stained with tears and dirt. R rika chan are you hurt? Don't worry about me. I have something I want to ask you, Keiichi. She grabs onto him tightly so he can't get away, and once again, asks him the question that everyone wants to know. Keiichi, did you do something bad on the night of the festival? My head began to throb. Mion asked me, Oishi-san asked me, Shion asked me, and now Rika-chan was asking me. They all knew, and they came to ask me, again and again, until I admitted it. At first, Keiichi claims that he does a lot of bad things, so he can't be sure. You know, like a liar. But just before Rika leaves, he calls back to her. For a solid minute, he says nothing, afraid of what she'll do if he admits his wrongdoing. She's the Shrine Maiden, after all, and the most likely candidate to be pissed at him. But then, Rika speaks. I don't really understand what you're worried about, Keiichi. Apparently, on the night of the festival, a cat snuck into the storehouse. A... cat? Yes, a cat. Meow meow. The... This cat? Who are you saying it was? The cat is a cat. Meow meow. Rika-chan, please tell me. The cat, what should it do now? The cat is just a cat, so it can just keep meowing and everything will be fine. This is a very strange conversation. Can I be the first one to say it? Keiichi goes on to ask for more advice on behalf of the cat. It can't just keep meowing. The dog saw the cat making mischief and sneaking inside. It keeps coming to the cat and trying to get it to say that it snuck inside. Rika goes silent and her expression clouds over. After a good solid minute to build tension, she speaks again. It's alright. I'll protect the cat. The cat is worrying too much. I'll do something about it for sure. Is that really all it took? To resolve the whole thing? Will you really be alright, Rika-chan? Keiichi begins to cry and confesses some more things. The cat is so sorry about entering and is scared because two of the other cats who went in with it... Keiichi is not sure that Rika knows about the murders, but oh look, she does! And she says it straight out! You should forget about them. The more you think about it, the scarier it will get. So you should forget about them as soon as possible. F forget Rika-chan, you know, don't you? You know how those two died. No matter how they died, it has nothing to do with you, Keiichi. Okay, that's a little freaky. What happened to sweet, adorable Rika? I guess, like all of the other characters, she has more dimensions than we thought. She's always been described as mature, and I guess she really is, huh? Finally, Keiji asks about Shion, the little sister cat. The big sister cat is angry. The little sister cat did something bad, so she's really mad. The big sister cat is not in a good mood at all. I think we should leave her alone for a while. Rika states plainly that they should stop having the club, and in the meantime, Keiichi is freaking out that Mion is mad about him entering the storehouse. But he only really has one option, doesn't he? Trust the little girl that she'll somehow be able to fix everything. Aha! Uh -huh. Real smart. The bell rings and Keiichi makes to head inside, but Rika stops him one more time. If the misunderstanding dog 
comes to try to bite the cat, please tell me, okay? The dog that bit the mayor? I don't know why it did that. If it was going to bite anyone, it would have been the trickster cat first. Rika admits that it should have been Keiichi. So is she really going to help him? Or no? Keiichi heads back inside, cautious but at least a little hopeful. That night, while Keiichi is freaking out about whether he should have told Rika or not, he gets a phone call from Shion. Sorry about last night. I got all riled up. I called you because I'm in a better mood. If you're sorry, then I'll forgive you, so please stop apologizing. The two agree that it was a much bigger taboo to go into the storehouse than they thought, and if they're going to get through this, they'll have to work together and share any info they have. Shion begins. I feel like someone has been watching me lately. She asks if Keiichi has felt the same thing, and though he denies it, she tells him to be careful regardless. Shion then proceeds to ask about Mion, saying that she seemed a little weird. Apparently, Mion asked her the same questions that she asked Keiichi, but Shion denied it as well. Now it's Keiichi's turn. First, he fills her in on what went down with Oishi when she left, and he wonders whether they should just tell the police about what's been happening, which Shion doesn't answer right away. She's hesitating because she doesn't think he'll trust her, a member of the Sonozaki family. So what is the deal with the Sonozaki family? We've been hearing a lot about them this chapter, but not about their involvement with the inciting incident, the dam project. What we know so far is that the whole town got together and fought the dam, right? Under the surface, the Sonozaki main house was doing all sorts of illegal things to oppose it. As far as I heard, they even kidnapped a child once. The child of an important person from the Ministry of Construction, who was in charge of the Hinamizawa Dam, got spirited away. The child was eventually found, of course, but right in the middle of this was the murder, which put further suspicion on the family that they were the true masterminds behind it. Keiichi doesn't want to believe these things about Mion's family, but Shion continues. My sister, though young, was the one who acted as the center of the illegal resistance movement. Apparently, Mion was quite the little rebel when she was young, and had been in and out of jail several times. I was dumbstruck at the tales of Mion's past. None of them matched the image I had of her. The more Shion tells me about Mion, the less I understand who Mion is. But one thing you've got to learn about this town, Keiichi, everybody's got secrets. He still wants to believe in his friend, so he's a little torn about what to think of Mion at the moment, but Shion quickly moves on. She's ultimately decided that Keiichi should tell the police, but to not involve Shion's name, to which he agrees. They also agree to tell each other any new info they receive. They're about to hang up, but Shion asks him one more question. Is it true that old man Kimiyoshi went missing? You mean the mayor? Wait, Shion, you haven't heard? Well, why didn't you tell me something that important right away? S sorry I thought you knew. Hey, Shion? Hello? I do. I... Old man Kimiyoshi, I... I told him everything. Keiichi feels relieved that he isn't the only person who told someone. He tries to comfort her as best he can. Old man Kimiyoshi. He's someone you feel comfortable confiding in, Shion? Yes. He would... When I was little, he was really nice to me. All I did was play tricks on him, but... He would always just... Smile. Keiichi asks just what she told him and how he reacted. He told me to leave it to him. <laughs> it's my fault because I I revealed everything. Stop it, Shion. It's not your fault. No, it is my fault. I I told him everything, so he has to have been killed. It was right after I told him. After all. He disappeared the same night that I confessed, and he told me everything was going to be all right. Hey, stop. The order's all wrong. You or I should have been killed first. Why the hell would someone else get killed first? No, it's an order. They must be planning to kill us last of all. I told him, so he was killed. He got killed because he knew. I confessed it to him, so he got killed. Amidst Shield's freakout, Keiji becomes aware of something. He still doesn't really believe Shion's theory, but if anybody who found out was being killed... Oh no. Keiichi confesses to Shion that he also told someone about that night. Rika-chan. He says a hasty goodbye and goes to check on her. I don't like this feeling. 
It's really bad. It's definitely, definitely bad. Damn it. Please be safe, Rika-chan. Rika doesn't pick up the phone. Keiji spends the next 20 minutes calling her, but she doesn't pick up the phone. In a panic, he decides to go to her house and check on her, but unfortunately, he doesn't know where she lives, so he does the only thing he can think of. He calls Rena. Huh? Keiji-kun? What do you need at a time like this? Like this? He explains the situation, though not why he believes that Rika might be in danger, but Rena immediately agrees to show him where her house is. She suggests calling Mion too, and though Keiji is a little hesitant, he agrees. The three meet up and head over to the Furude Shrine. Rena immediately notices something off as soon as they arrive. They're gone. That's odd. Rika-chan and Satoko-chan always leave their bikes here. Oh, right. I forgot to mention, Rika and Satoko live together since, you know, all of their parents and family members are dead from the curse. As they approach the house, Keiji is a little surprised. It's just a simple prefab shack, two stories. Apparently, it used to be a storage shed slash shelter for the town council in case of emergency, but now the two girls live on its upper floor. The lights are off. When Rena calls out, there's no response. Mion bangs on the shutter at the front. It's locked. I wonder if we can get in somehow. Holy shit, what happened to Rena the Space Cadet? I think she is somehow the most competent person in this story right now. Rena goes off to check on the main house, and Mion and Keiji get a ladder to try the second story windows. Keiji, being an idiot as always, hasn't even thought about any of this and asks about the main house and Rika and Satoko's situation. Finally. And Mion mentions that Satoko's whole family is dead, including her brother, Satoshi. He also asks why Rika isn't living in the main house. I think she tried that at first. She said it was hard though because it reminded her of her parents. Rika-chan and Satoko-chan, they have it hard, huh? She's cursed. Huh? I said, she's cursed. Uh-oh, it's happening again. And unfortunately, this time he's on the top of a ladder, so there's nowhere to run. Satoko Hojo. She's been cursed by Oyashiro-sama. In her bizarre state, Mion goes to talk about how everyone in her life died around her. Her parents, who it seems were not the nicest of people, her aunt, who also treated her like crap, and of course, her brother, her gallant knight and protector. Without any prodding from Keiichi, Mion switches topics and begins talking about Satoshi instead. He was always so earnest. He worked so hard he nearly ground his bones into dust, all for his one and only little sister. And yet, someone made him disappear. Poor, poor Satoshi-kun. He was never rewarded, that Satoshi-kun. How ungrateful that child is. Mion breaks down and begins muttering to herself about how all the disappearances are somehow... Satoko's fault? None of this is making any sense to me. This whole time, Mion's been the one we've had our eye on, so where is all this stuff about Satoko coming from? Mion is now losing her goddamn mind. The ladder is rocking back and forth so hard that Keiji thinks he's going to fall, but just before he does, Rena returns, followed by about four or five adults. Keiji-kun, Mi-chan, sorry I took so long. I borrowed the key. Oh, nice one. I was getting worried. Okay, and now Mion is completely back to normal. Great. With the help of the adults whom Rena picked up along the way, they get the front shutter open and climb the stairs to the girl's apartment. It's a tiny little space, but seems awfully cozy. Unfortunately, there is no sign of either of them. The adults begin to mutter amongst themselves, but Mion quickly brings them to attention. I don't want to believe it, but the mayor, Kimiyoshi, disappeared yesterday. We can't say this is unrelated. Mion promptly gave directions to the villagers. The adults followed them without hesitation, despite her age. The adults all scatter to different parts of town to look for them while the teenagers stay in the apartment. Mion's making some phone calls, and Keiichi and Rena take a look around to see if there's any clues. Rena, I don't think you'll find Rikachan by opening the refrigerator or the cabinet underneath the sink. I just thought they might be hiding. Huh? How? Pretty soon, more people show up to help search. Down below, Mion gives them all orders and everyone scatters. Keiichi, trying to be helpful and failing as always, just starts wandering off in a direction that no one has gone yet. 
It would have been perfectly normal for me to be scared of the dark. However, I didn't feel that way. It was because tonight, someone had already disappeared. It would take some time before I, exhausted as I was, would feel guilt at the cause of my own selfish sense of relief. After wandering for a while, Keiji finds himself at the top of a hill, one that he can see the whole town from. He falls to his knees and claws at the ground. I couldn't figure out if I was feeling sorrow or frustration. I couldn't endure the burden of my own sin. I had just told Rika-chan about it. They had nothing to do with it, but Rika-chan and even Satoko had, had been sacrificed. It was like a cross that Shion and I would each have to bear the weight of until we ourselves were erased. He realizes then the real sin, of course, which was going into the ritual storehouse in the first place. And I'd like to take a moment, much like I did in the first chapter, to just take a step back. We do have this wonderful view to look at, anyway. This chapter feels very different from the last, doesn't it? Back then we felt confused, horrified, and above all else, like we ourselves were going mad. Of course, if Ryukishi thought he could pull us down to those same depths of madness twice, he would be sorely mistaken. We know now what lurks behind the quaint little town and the fun club activities, which is why he didn't try to do that. Instead, all we feel is sadness. This was a story that was so easily preventable, and I think, for the very first time, Keiichi is understanding that. He's feeling a self-awareness of his actions for one of the first times since we've met him. Of course, that character development has come far too late, which is ultimately the tragedy of it all. Further amplifying that feeling is the fact that now we know what's going to happen at the end of this chapter. The timeline is going to reset, and we are going to be back at square one for the next. Keiji realizing his mistakes now is purely futile. Or is it? Because I have a theory that the timeline resets are not as complete as one might initially think. In order to prove this, I'd like to compare two scenes for you. In the first chapter, when Oishi tells Keiji about Rena's past, he immediately begins to question and doubt her, and Oishi is able to turn him against his friends easily. Yet in this chapter, it takes the combined work of Oishi, Shion, and Mion herself to even begin to foster doubt in Keiji's mind about the intentions of Mion. So, in some small way, I'd like to think that Keiichi is learning from his mistakes, even if he doesn't really remember. So, maybe there's at least a small bit of hope after all. But not for this timeline. That development has come far too late. Keiichi-kun? Keiichi-kun, are you okay? Rena finds him and comes over to rub his back as he's still on the ground. This is all my fault. It's because of me, it's my fault. Keiichi-kun's fault? You didn't do anything wrong. Please don't blame yourself for this. But, of course, she doesn't really understand what's happening. Keiichi already feels the weight of what he's done to Rika and Satoko, so at the very least he can spare Rena, but it seems as if she already knows to some extent. Somehow. Wow, Rena's got really good intuition it's almost scary. I think she's scarier now than when she was actually crazy yikes. Are you thinking that Brenna might disappear now too? You don't need to worry about that. Brenna isn't going anywhere, I promise. Famous last words, but he takes her at her word. Please, don't disappear. Please, don't. As long as I'm still here. Rena says that crying doesn't suit him and guides him back to the house, where there's some hot miso soup waiting. By the looks on everyone's faces, it doesn't look like they found them. School ended, and they went home. Then, the two of them went somewhere on their bicycles. Moreover, nobody saw them riding their bikes, so... It's not looking good. The group decides that there's nothing more they can do tonight, and so they should head home. But before they do, they're interrupted. Oh my my my. I knew I smelled something good coming from over here. Oishi is, of course, among the police officers looking for the two girls. He offers to give Keiichi and Rena a ride home, and reluctantly, they accept. Rena's house is first, but on the way, Keiichi slowly loses consciousness. His peace doesn't last very long, however. Hello? My Barasan! Are you asleep back there? Oishi is slapping Keiichi gently and holding a can of coffee under his nose. K 
Keiichi accepts it before he's fully awake and realizes a little too late that Oishi is sitting next to him in the back of the car. Okay, listen, I know I made the joke last chapter, but holy shit, this man is lucky this story takes place in the 80s. Or maybe not. <laughs> Please don't get all formal on me. I'm not going to eat you or anything. Stop, please. I'm kidding, of course. What Oishi really wants is information, and he's willing to pseudo-kidnap a child to get it. Instead of asking straight out, however, Oishi phrases it as if it's Keiichi who needs to talk to him. Here I was sure that you had something you wanted to talk to me about. There's a long silence, then Oishi starts questioning him properly. He makes sure he and Keiji are on the same page about Tomatake and Takano's murders, but he has something else to add. They're saying it was bad luck. The lock to it had been replaced by a simpler one, which made it easier for the thieves to get inside. I mean, you know, ever since the priest and his wife passed away, Rika Furude has been managing the place, right? Apparently, she talked to the mayor, saying she wanted them replaced with a lighter, more simple padlock because the bars were too heavy for her. This is news to us. Well, it is if you haven't been reading the tips like I have. This also brings up an interesting idea. What if it was entirely coincidence that Keiichi and Shion just happened to talk to the two people who were about to be sacrificed? What if they were the victims of Onikakushi this year, not because Keiichi and Shion told them, but because they were the ones who allowed the storehouse to be broken into? Oishi also has a third theory, that someone is trying to eliminate all of the heads of the three great families of Hinamizawa. Again, we'd have heard of them if we had time to go over the tips as well, but the Furudes, the Kimiyoshis, and the Sonozakis are the three big kahunas who run the village. Up until recently, the Kimiyoshis had all the real power, but nowadays they're really just puppets for the Sonozaki family. And considering that Rika is the only surviving Furude, they don't have a lot of pushback. But if Oishi is right, that brings up a scary possibility, that Mion herself might be the next victim. Nobody wants that, right? If there's anything you've noticed about Mion Sonozaki lately, please tell me. At this point, his hand is clamped onto Keiji's shoulder, very tightly. Luckily for Keiichi, they're interrupted by the police radio. Oishi is being called back from the field, and so he decides to leave it there for the evening. He opens the door and allows Keiichi to exit the car. My Barasan, just a little bit of courage from you might end up being what saves many of your friends in the end. There's no proof that something won't happen tomorrow night as well. It's our job to prevent such things before they happen. But for that, we need your cooperation. My Barasan. He mentions that he'll be stopping by every day until Keiichi is ready to talk, which is totally against the law, but what's a kid to do? For now, Keiichi heads back into his house and passes out before he even makes it to his bedroom. Okay, this next day is where a lot of information gets put together, so I'm gonna say a lot of things really fast. Bear with me. The next day, Keiichi barely drags himself to school with the help of Rena. Mion's absent, so it's just the two of them at lunch. For a while, they try to keep each other cheerful, but the attempt is pitiful and doesn't last long. Sorry. I, I mean, well, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's not your fault. The police... The village, still, nobody really knows about Rika and Satoko's disappearance. The police thinks that they must have gone to Okinomiya to play and vanished there. But both Keiichi and Rena think that's wrong. For Keiichi, it's just a gut feeling, but it's clear as she goes to a secluded spot to wash out her bento that she has a little more evidence than that. The whole thing about Rika-chan and Satoko-chan going into town to play and then disappearing? That didn't make sense for some reason. So I decided to investigate a little myself. While everyone was searching for the girls, Rena was helping the ladies club make the miso soup. The owner of a tofu shop happened to stop by and mentioned that Satoko came to the shop after school, and this gets Rena thinking. Do you remember when we went to Rika-chan's house? There was a pot on her gas cooker, and there was miso soup in it. They must have been planning to make chilled tofu. It was on a plate in plastic wrap. Still, Rena, why does this matter? When you make miso soup, you put the tofu in last. That means that Rika-chan or Satoko-chan, whoever was cooking, was standing there making it up until right before dinner time. In addition, there were a bunch of uneaten side dishes in the fridge and rice in the rice cooker, which means that the girls couldn't have just gone out to play. So where did they go? And why did they leave before dinner? 
Rena has a theory about that as well. On their fold-out table, there were things like soy sauce and a chopstick holder. The container for the soy sauce? It was empty. Chilled tofu wouldn't taste good without it. The bigger container of soy sauce under their sink was also empty, so the conclusion Rena comes to is that they realized they were out of soy sauce after Satoko had started making dinner and Rika went out to a neighbor's house to borrow some, which it seems is not that uncommon an occurrence in Hinamizawa. No matter how long Satoko-chan waited though, Rika-chan didn't come back. So then Satoko-chan called up the house where Rika-chan was going. Then the other person must have replied with something like this. We have plenty of food here, so you should come too, Satoko-chan. Rika-chan has already eaten. They both think it's pretty strange that someone would coincidentally make enough extra food for two people without knowing they were coming. Which, I mean... I do, but in my household, I'm called the queen of leftovers. This was all only circumstantial evidence and Rena's guesswork. Even so, it was all extremely convincing. Holy shit, I'm with him. Rena, more like Shirla Rena. Okay, I'm banning myself from making jokes ever again. Just when Keiji gets to asking her the most important part, who she thinks called them over, Rena clams up and tells him to keep it a secret from the police. Sure, that's not... alarming. Before he can question her further, however, a couple of younger girls show up to wash their bentos out, so the conversation is effectively over. Later on, Rena and Keiji once more walk home together, only to find that Oishi has his car parked right outside Keiji's house. His parents aren't home, so it's no big deal, but Rena seems a little concerned. What do the police want with you? With you? I'm not the culprit. I know that. That said, I can't say that I'm totally uninvolved with the incident. Keiji agrees to tell her about it the next time they talk, and Rena heads home, leaving Keiji to deal with Mr. Fun Times over here. Once again, Oishi has Keiji get into his car so they can talk. Listen, I promise no more jokes, but I'm itching so hard right now. After a solid minute of silence, Keiji finally asks how the investigation is going. They're officially secret investigations, and we're under a media blackout, but I'll let you in on them. As far as the first incident goes, we don't learn much of anything. Takano's time of death is difficult to determine, but she probably died right around the same time as Tomatake. Quickly moving on to the mayor's disappearance, however, yields us something of value. Apparently, he was suffering from severe hemorrhoids. On the day he disappeared, he had an appointment for a checkup, so he went out first thing in the morning. He didn't tell anyone because it's obviously a little embarrassing. The line at the big hospital was pretty big, even with an appointment, so he didn't leave until 1 o'clock, then ate lunch before heading home. He would have made it back to Hinamizawa in plenty of time, but there was an accident on his train. Seems it delayed him a bit, and he only got back to his house right before the meeting was scheduled to start. The meeting, of course, being the one he was last seen at, which, according to Oishi, was a meeting by the three families to discuss the curse. So then, on his way home... The old man who had treated Shion like his own daughter. Shion's painful voice struck me right in the heart. Hmm? Huh? You might be realizing it too, right around now. Something that Keiichi struggles to admit to himself for the next couple of minutes. Let's give the poor boy a second to catch up. He's a little slow. That all meant he had absolutely no contact with anyone else. Okay. But what does that mean, Keiji Maibara? Ah. I... Old man Kimiyoshi, I... I told him everything! Hey, Keiji Maibara. No more playing dumb. When did she tell him? Oishi proceeds to question Keiichi, telling him that he knows he's not the culprit and asking what he saw in the storehouse. He seems disappointed that there's no drug operations or anything like that. Throughout all of this, though, Keiichi isn't really listening. Until, that is, Oishi tries a little pathos on him. I suppose I won't bother hiding it anymore. You are the only one to escape harm so far. Everyone but you has disappeared. Wait, wait a second. What do you mean by you alone? Jiro Tomitake-san and Mio Takano-san died that night, and Shion Sonozaki disappeared the next day. Holy hell, what the fuck? But... but Shion didn't disappear. And if she did, 
Who's Cage you've been talking to this whole time? Now it's Keiichi's turn to question Oishi a bit. It turns out that the last time anyone saw Shion is the two of them at the library before she ran away. It, it can't be. It, it can't be. It can't be. Shion had already disappeared? This revelation shocks him and us so much that we as the audience apparently pass out because when we next pick up, Keiichi is in his living room desperately trying to not have a panic attack. He knows for a second that Shion will call him again tonight, so what's his plan? Ultimately, he decides to play dumb and try to get as much info out of her as he can. I would listen to what she had to say and fend her off. I would tear the skin off the monster. But one thing that still bugs him is that the imposter sounds exactly like Shion, and there's only one person who can do that. Why though? Why would Mion- Keiichi steals himself for this encounter, and as soon as he does, the phone rings. I should start by picking up the phone. Pick it up, Keiichi. Pick it up, Keiichi. Ah, uh, Keichan? It's me. It's Shion. Sure thing! They have another conversation, this time with Keiichi trying to covertly question her without her realizing it. However, she ends up getting under his skin by talking about Rika and Satoko and how they're most likely dead. There was no longer any doubt that it was my fault. I killed them. Why? Why... Why kidnap someone and then kill them? Erasing them and killing them without a second thought like this? You're right. You're absolutely right. It would take a demon. Getting more and more agitated, Keiji finally breaks and just outright begins to question her about when she talked to the mayor. Slowly, he backs her into a corner, telling her about how it would have been impossible for her to do so, and how she's apparently been missing since the day after Watanagashi. The next morning finds Keiichi utterly numbed the world. His parents even suggest that he would be okay to miss a couple of days of school, and he really doesn't respond. The doorbell rings, Rena coming to get him since he's a little late, and Keiichi goes to tell her that he'll be off school for a little while. She is entirely understanding and kind, and Keiichi doesn't seem to feel like he deserves it. Rena, you're not going to question me? Rena, you know, don't you? About that night, what I... Do you mean when you snuck into the ritual storehouse? Because of course she knows. Everybody knows at this point. Rena mentions that Mion was pretty upset by it. Not even by the taboo transgression, but more because Keiichi lied about it to her. Keiichi-kun, hypothetically, if you had admitted you'd done something wrong right away and apologized to Michan, I wonder if Rika-chan and Satoko-chan wouldn't have had to disappear. It's a cruel statement to make, but it might honestly be true. If Keiichi just manned up and apologized, maybe the residents of Hinamizawa wouldn't have had to be punished for his transgression. Rana slaps him, hard, but he hardly even feels it. I don't think anyone has scolded you, Keiichi-kun, so I'll scold you in their place, okay? She tells him off for a few minutes, and honestly, it feels like a weight has been lifted in the story. Rena makes to leave, but then Keiji sees something that makes her stop. Rena has handed him a community notice to read and pass on, and he just happens to see a certain page. We still have plenty of homemade soy sauce in stock. Feel free to come to the Sonozaki house if you want some. If you would need some soy sauce, then you would go to the Sonozaki house. Rena... Did you... did you know all along? All the pieces are falling into place. Every strange mystery surrounding the disappearances this chapter, all of them make sense if the culprit was Mion. Though I'm sure you all already guessed that. I'm... I'm going to Mion. I'll go apologize. I'm going too. If you get wrapped up in this too, then I think I might actually go crazy. If Keiichi-kun disappeared as well, then I think I might actually go crazy too. So together they leave Keiichi's house. Their destination? The Sonozaki residence. It doesn't look like they'll be alone though. As it turns out, Oishi is already waiting right outside Keiichi's house. Hey, good morning, my Ibarra-san. To you too, Ryugu-san. Together so early in the morning. 
You make me jealous. <laughs> they get in his car and tell him everything. As it turns out, Oishi has also suspected Mion, and they're already keeping constant watch over her house. Unfortunately, they can't get in without a warrant, but if a friend were to just make a visit, Rena deduces that that was Oishi's plan all along, to get Keiichi to confess and enter the Sonozaki residence for him, and he offers her a job at the police department. I would honestly want to see that. Oishi elects to drive them, and they head on their way. Want to buy some tea biscuits on the way there? Neither Rena nor I went along with Oishi's on stupid joke. With the police outside ready to make an arrest or break in if there's trouble, Keiji and Rena take the walk down the private road to the house, determined to convince their friend to turn herself in. After a minute of waiting by the gate, Mion makes an appearance. Well, this is unusual. Aren't you two going to school? Keichan is one thing, but you too, Rena? You two are such troublemakers. For the first few minutes, everything seems light and easy. The three of them talk about non-consequential things and laugh at each other's dumb jokes. If it weren't for the saddest shit music playing in the background, I'd think this scene was from the beginning of this chapter. Mion makes the two of them some tea. Do you want sesame senbei to go with it? Sorry we don't have much in the way of bean paste or other good stuff. It's okay. We didn't really come here to drink tea anyway. And there goes the mood, though Mion tries to play it lightly. What would Keichan have to tell me? Please give me your daughter's hand in marriage, maybe? <laughs> Can't do that. My little Rena and Keichan aren't meant for each other. Go wash your face with miso soup and try again later. Mion, first, I have something to apologize for. Well, on the night of the Watanagashi, the ritual storehouse behind the shrine, I went in there. Mion's face becomes harder. It's been days since then. It may be too late, but I apologize. What I did was wrong. Please, forgive me. Mion doesn't really seem to take him seriously, brushing off his apology like what he did was no big deal, like it doesn't concern her. So Keiichi and Rena decide to tell her everything. They lay out all their evidence about Rika and Satoko's disappearance, and though Mion denies it at every turn, eventually, they have her cornered. I had no idea I had such an incredible detective right next to me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. You've got me. You've got me. <laughs> they finally tell her their trump card, that the police have surrounded her house and start firing questions at her. But Mian doesn't answer any of them. At least, not yet. I could sense it. It was now, in this moment. Mion had ceased to be Mion, but had changed into Mion Sonazaki the current heir to the Sonazaki house. We meet for the first time. I am the current heir to the Sonazaki house. My name is Mion. It seems as though you have various things you would like to ask. If I can be of assistance, then I would like to answer, without concealing anything. So, of course, the two ask her the obvious question. Why would you do this? and she spins them a tale of the history of Hinamizawa, how the residents of Onigafuchi were worshipped as transcendents in the old days, until the modern era began and Japan attempted to throw away much of its old ways. Then they were harassed and belittled. Finally, after the Second World War, the husband of Oryo, Mion's grandmother, and the head of the Sonozaki family made a fortune selling canned meat he'd stolen from the military, and the town became prosperous once again. Unfortunately, ten years later, it was discovered that the meat in the cans was human flesh, an experiment by the government to get easy protein to the soldiers on the front lines. Now the man-eating demons were man-eating demons once again. That history has faded now, but there's still so much standing on the Sonozaki family's shoulders, on Mion's shoulders, to bring back and maintain the old ways, and to lead the villagers and bring them all together. My grandmother, the family head, once told the children of the village this, if they throw a stone at one of you, then two of you must throw stones back. The children asked her, what if we're attacked by a thousand people? Even that answer was simple. If a thousand people attack you, then everyone in Hinamizawa will stand up against them. This isn't a mentality that began with the dam project. It has existed for years and years. Keiji asks if this is why the curse has happened every year, to bring back the old ways and, by extension, the peace that existed back then. She doesn't... really answer him. That was the earnest wish of our ancestors in Onigafuchi, and the mission of those who inherit the demon in the Sonozaki main family. Wait, 
what's this about a demon? According to Mion, it's a metaphorical thing. There's the character for demon in her name, and she has a demon engraved somewhere on her body as well. After saying all this, Keiichi can see the immense weight on her shoulders, and now it seems that she too is willing to put down that burden and turn herself in. However, Rena isn't done. She still faces Mion with the gravity of her crimes, despite the burden, and Mion admits that she killed Kimiyoshi and Rika because they replaced the lock on the storehouse with a cheap one. Keiji realizes, again, I think this is like the fifth time now, that it is truly his fault that all of these people are dead. He cries, Rena cries, Mion cries, everybody's crying. Mion tells Keiji that it's really her fault, after all, she's the one who did the deed, and who made the active decision to do them in the first place. Still, Michan, you saved one person of your own volition. You left Keiichi-kun alive. Hmm, why didn't I kill him? As a demon, I can't even begin to guess. Maybe Mion had some reason she didn't want to kill you. Okay, that's... somewhat unnerving. Ultimately, Mion is now ready to turn herself in. She just has one last request. She wants a half an hour alone with Keichan to walk the grounds. This could be a cute thing, you know? Like, Keichi's kind of the guy she had a crush on, and at least she gets that for a little while before a lifetime in prison, right? Oh, but my friends... This is Higarashi. The alarm bells are ringing. Both Rena and Keiichi allow this to happen, and Mion takes him out to the yard. Mion grabs onto Keiichi's arm and begins walking. During those nostalgic days of the bustling commotion at Angel Mort, I counted back and was amazed. It had only been one week ago. I had been arm in arm with Xion then, too. Linking arms with Mion like this really reminded me that they were twins much strength they put into it. The sensation of their arms, their warmth, and the blood flowing. I could feel that their living sensations were all exactly the same. Mion and Keiichi discuss the twins' relationship briefly and just how weird it is, and then Mion guides him into the forest. Okay, alarm bells are getting louder. Shion is... still alive. I'd been thinking to give her the most horrible death of all, so I had her locked up. I never did think of a good way to do it, though. Keiichi is proud of her that she not only saved one person, but two. Man, Keiichi, you really want to think the best of your friend, huh? Come with me. I want you to see all of my sins. Keiichi hesitates, but he vows that no matter what he sees, she's still his best friend, Mion. She leads him deep into the forest to a sort of bomb shelter, the Sonozaki's secret lair, as it were. Despite what he knows he's about to see, Keiichi steals himself. I am nothing more than a demon, so I don't understand human feelings anymore. I have a feeling, though, that I know why Mion fell in love with you. Don't say that like it's not related to you. You're Mion. You're not a demon. You're a human. With human blood. You're my friend. They head into the tunnel. The structure is essentially a second compound with storage areas, living areas, and an underground torture chamber. Wow, it's got everything! And unlike the ritual storehouse, these tools look like they actually see use. So that's fun. Right here is where I killed everyone. There were no spectators to watch me, but I did the Watanagashi very well. Well, perhaps there was one spectator. Me. I, the demon, was watching the entire time Mion held the Watanagashi ceremony. Onwards and downwards we go! Next, she takes him to the prison, which is so deep that it's a little more than rough stone cages with iron bars on the front. Keiichi asks where the corpses are, and Mion replies she threw them down the well, which upsets Keiichi somewhat that he won't even be able to say goodbye, but there's still people alive down here. Keiichan? Is that you, Keiichan? Are you alright, Shion? Are you hurt? No. No. No! Shion sees Mion behind Keiichi and panics. Keiichi tries to calm her down, saying that it's all over, but of course, he is ultimately the one who is wrong. Sparks fly, and Keiichi gets knocked out. Well, mostly. He can still kind of hear what's going on around him. Now then, I wonder how I should go about preparing you. <laughs> oh, yes. What do you think of a bed of nails? I tested it on those two little brats, but their hands were too small for the restraining table. Let's do that! Let's do that! <laughs> no! Please! Stop! Sis! Please! Stop! 
My, you sure can cry with a cute voice, can't you? Your unnatural bravado is making my skin crawl, but this definitely suits you the best. <laughs> Mio, my big sister, I beg you. I don't care how you choose to kill me, but please, at least let Kei-chan go. Mion agrees, sort of, on one condition, that she own grovel and beg for her forgiveness. She does so, throwing away all her pride, but in the end, Mion goes back on her word and takes Keiichi off to the torture chamber. There, she locks Keiichi's hands, every joint of his fingers, into restraints stretched out on a hard table. Can you hear it, Shion? I'm going to get started now! Please, enjoy Keiichi's young screams! Give it a fucking rest. Awake at last, are we? I lied before, you know about having wanted to give Shion the most miserable death at all, but locking her up because I hadn't thought of a good way yet. That was a lie. Now Mion brings out a toolbox with a hammer and a bunch of nails. I'll let her hear the screams of all those people that died because of her, and after they've soaked into her very soul, then I'll kill her. I've got pretty good taste, huh? <laughs> Who are you? Huh? I'm Mion. Mion Sonazaki. Has the fear driven you crazy? <laughs> no, you're not. There's no way you can be Mion Sonazaki. I see. Then if I'm not Mion, who am I? A demon. Huh? You're not Mion. Mion was just here. Give her back. Keichan, is your brain really doing okay? You're not going crazy with fear? Don't touch me, you damn demon. Give her back. Give me on back, my best friend. Give me on back! <laughs> you really are a piece of work, you know that? moment, Mion Zonazaki is trying to kill you, and you're trying to reject me? Keiichi continues to reject her, and Mion continues to laugh. Keiichi begs Mion to fight, and at first, it seems like she's lost to this demon. Is that all? I'm going to get started now. Be sure to give her some good screams. It seems, however, that the excitement is leaving Mion's face, and for a second, she returns to being herself. She tells Keiichi that the demon awoke in her because of a small opportunity, that being Keiichi not giving her the doll. Do you remember that? God, that was a long time ago. This might be strange for me, a demon, to say, but you're the reason that everything got so messed up. Mion holds the nails to his first pinky joint, intending to hammer nails into all the joints of his fingers, but she hesitates. Keiichi is taking this surprisingly well. If she wants to kill him, if that will satisfy her sense of revenge, then so be it. But that's no fun, right? He asks to make a deal with her. She says that she can't agree to two of his conditions, to let Shion go and to give me on her body back, but she can agree to the third that he jokingly made. She says that she will leave him alive. But just before she begins, the two hear a noise, a loud, rhythmic thumping. The police have arrived. I won't kill you. But I will have you go to sleep for a bit, Kei-chan. Oishi will be here soon. This will only hurt a bit. She pulls out a stun gun, but before she places it to his skin, she says one last thing. I'm sorry for disgracing Mion. If you ever see me after today, don't come near me. By then, it will be the demon that inherited my corpse. Before Keiichi can ask her what she means, she activates the stun gun, and the lights go out. After this, we're told through an official report that the police rescued Keiichi and Shion, but unfortunately, Mion got away. Shion herself has become so paranoid and affected by this that she's locked herself up somewhere in Shishibone City and moves locations frequently. Keiichi, though not as drastically, is also affected by what he experienced. Every night, he sits in his room by the phone, waiting for Mion to call him, which of course she never does. He also has another copy of the doll that he never gave her waiting on his desk. 
One night, he's awoken by someone throwing gravel at his window, and he looks down to see with shock that it's Mion. He runs down, bringing the doll with him. But of course, we know what happens. I'm done. This is my limit. <laughs> he gets fucking stabbed. What did she say to you before? What did she fucking say? That if you ever run into her again, it'll be the goddamn demon, KG, you idiot! Luckily for him, the wound isn't fatal, and his parents find him and take him to the hospital, where he spends several weeks recovering. He later finds out that that same night, Shion fell off a balcony and died. So, it looks like the demon really did get its wish. Oishi comes to visit Keiichi at the hospital, and after a few minutes of small talk, gets to what's on his mind. Apparently, over the course of their continued exploration into the tunnels beneath the Sonozaki property, they found a well, with all the bodies down at the bottom of it, including bones from missing persons cases from a decade ago. This is a bit of a detour, but you know Rika Furude-san, right? Did she ever tell you anything along the lines of her regularly taking insulin injections for diabetes? Keiichi obviously doesn't, and Oishi continues. Actually, we found it in her shirt pocket. A syringe. It has long since been crushed, so the medicine couldn't be identified, but it's definitely strange that a little girl would bring a syringe on her way to get soy sauce. There's also one more thing. It seems that the police found Mion. Keiichi asks how she is, but Oishi dodges the question, instead insisting that Keiichi tell him one more time who he thinks stabbed him and pushed Shion. Please. Don't make me say it again. It was Mion. Mion Sonozaki. Actually, we found Mion Sonozaki at the bottom of the well, too. We believe that as she was trying to escape to that hidden passage in the well, her foot slipped while climbing down the ladder. She fell to the bottom, broke her neck, and died. The autopsy was conclusive. Mion definitely died the day that the police stormed the Sonozaki place. So who in the hell stabbed Keiichi? There's another odd parallel in this case, however. When conducting the autopsy on Mio Takano's body, it was discovered that she must have died 24 hours before. But that can't be because numerous people saw her at the festival right before she went missing. Her intrusion in the ritual storehouse, which I had come to regret countless times. The one who tempted me. When she invited us into the storehouse, she was already no longer of this world. Oishi thanks Keiichi for his time, and promises somewhat ominously that they'll see each other again. He leaves, and Keiichi muses to himself. He wanted to end the incident as it applied to me. <laughs> what was over? Nothing was over. The incident was still continuing. Hey, John. I told you. Remember? What, Mion? What did you tell me? I warned you on that day. After today, if you see me, it will be the demon that has possessed my body. Kei-chan, I've come for you. Mion, her body broken and bloody, emerges from beneath the bed. Someone, please end this incident. This cruel, tragic, unfortunate, sad incident. Please, end it. That is my only wish. I granted you one before, remember? You don't get any more. <laughs> Mion firmly held the nail down on my fingertip, and with her other hand... She slowly swung a mallet up in the air, and... I mean... What is there to really say, after that? There isn't much I can add, and I'm really bad at conclusions anyway. So, I think this time, I'll just let this ending speak for itself. Was it truly Mion's ghost coming to haunt him, or a hallucination brought on by PTSD and stress, or was she somehow truly still alive? 
And I guess you'll just have to come back next time and see. Huh? Thank you for joining me. For joining all of us here. And get a good night's sleep tonight.